Then you had the housing fiasco that crashed the world economy. Then you've got this pandemic. It's never a good time to invest, but you've got to set aside money now and start investing. It doesn't matter whether you're whether you're 20 with a little bit or whether you're 50 with a lot. You need you need to figure out how to live below your means and find some money to invest somewhere. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Another episode of the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, 180. Today, Jace, what's going on? How are you? Doing great, man. How you doing? Doing well. Hanging in there. Hanging in there. We were talking, well, first of all, you love Austin, right? How much would it take you, how much would someone have to pay you to leave Austin? Uh, I don't want to leave Austin. <laughs> I love it here. I mean, I did look at that. I did look that lifeguards in California were making almost 400 grand, but no, I'm not leaving Austin. It, it, it would take a lot. My wife and I have discussed this. Lifestyle-wise, it's just a great place for us, great place to raise a family. We love it here. It'd take a lot, man. It would take a lot. Yeah. Well, I just asked because I, I came across this article on CNBC, I think a, a week ago or so. And it says there's a website called makemymove.com where lots of cities in the US, and you mentioned Tulsa before we started recording, are paying you or giving you some sort of living incentive or stipend to move there. And so I started scrolling down and I'm like, okay, l- l- let's see here what's going on. So the title is some cities are paying people up to $16,000 to move there. Um, they say, go to this makemymove.com. I haven't checked that out, admittedly, but it says, here are a couple examples it gives. So here you go. For example, Baltimore, Maryland will pay $5,000 towards your down payment on a new home. A place in Alabama, you can get 10000 in cash over the course of the year if you're accepted into a relocation program. Let's see. Another generous offer comes from Southwest Michigan, 90 miles from Chicago, where new Michigan residents can get a $15,000 forgivable grant over the course of three years after buying a home in a qualifying zip code. Newcomers can also choose from additional perks like free gym memberships, co-working space, or transit passes for a year. Uh, It also mentions programs in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Tulsa, Oklahoma. So anyway, I just thought, that's I mean, it's a lot of money. Totally. $15,000. If you only have to stay a year, you're working remotely right now, go live in a different city, explore something. Just interesting to think about. So where are you moving, Clark? I don't know. Chattanooga, <laughs> Tennessee sounded pretty nice to me. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'd be curious if we had anybody that we knew that's taken advantage of those programs. So if, if, if you have, if you're out there, write into us, let us know how it's worked out for you. Yeah, I wonder. It's probably somebody. Oh, totally. Uh, we, we received a inter, uh, nice uh, five-star review on iTunes from Vermont Redbeard. Redbeard Vermont. How about that? I typically spend three to four hours a day driving, so I get my share of podcasts. Even the most entertaining ones I listen to and end up falling, falling into a loop and regurgitating the same things. Millionaires Unveiled is one of the rare shows that covers a consistent theme but does not bore me after now listening to over 100 shows. Great job, guys. Can't wait to be on the show someday myself. So thanks for that, Vermont Redbeard, and and thanks for everybody who leaves a review and helps us grow the show and and reach new millionaire interviewees and listeners, and we're we're appreciative for that. On today's show, we have Harry. He's an Army vet. He's been in the Army for over 20 years. He has a net worth of $1.8 million, also has a pension. Over 100 million, excuse me, oh, that'd be nice, right? Over a million dollars in various other retirement accounts, about a $250,000 house, and some uh, startup bank stocks. Jace, what's the $250,000 house here on Harry on today's episode? What is the, the most expensive house we've seen in our millionaires? Hey, that's an interesting question. I know we've got one coming up. We haven't released, but it'll be soon that, dev- that had a million dollar paid for house. But I, I don't know, man. That'd be an interesting stat. One, what was what they paid for it, and then maybe what it's worth now, because obviously there's several that probably you know have seen their house price double or whatever. But I can't think of any others. Yeah, that, I don't. Yeah, besides that one, I I can't think of many others that we've done that have over a house worth over a million dollars. Yeah, I mean, I know there's a couple out there that that are two million or three million. You know, a couple episodes I can think of, but far and few between those that have a house. Either that they paid for over a million or that is now valued over a million. 
Although that might have changed over the course of this pandemic, since it seems like everywhere in the nation is 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 going bonkers <laughs> with house <laughs> prices right now. The, the lumber inside of it for sure has gone up by four times. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, anyway, something interesting. I mean, pretty amazing net worth of $2 million living in a $250,000 house. Maybe it's gone up though. Maybe it's now 400000 by the time we recorded this, so... Anyway, last week we had a a great interview with Dan. He had a net worth of 3.8. He's an immigrant, came to the U.S. when he was 17 years old and only had about 10 bucks in his pocket. He worked at the same company for over 30 years, so something we don't see very much. He's 61 now, recently retired, and reflects back on on his journey. So, fun interview with Dan there. If you're interested in any multifamily investment opportunities, send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. Same email if you'd like to just connect or to be on the show. So thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And without any further delay, please help me welcome Harry to the show. Harry, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? Well, I've spent most of my life working for the uh, working for the Army, either as, a, either as a soldier. I spent a long time, about 20 years in the Army Reserve after my active duty time. and. Uh, Currently, I manage an environmental program for the Army. Wow. So you've been lifelong military? I was. I spent 30 years in the military. I did about 10 or 11 years of active duty. I uh, got, in, got in at the what they said was the largest commissioning class they, that they ever had out of college. Got out during the, during the drawdown in the, uh, in the 90s and went in the Army Reserves for the balance of my career. Wow. Thank you for your service, by the way. So what is your net worth today? Our, our net worth, mine and my wife's, is about $1.8 million. And let's break that down for our listeners. We've got about 400000 in the TSP and the Life Cycle 2035 fund. We've got about another two two twenty in the uh, in the Target Retirement 2030 fund at Vanguard in a traditional IRA. We've got a little bit in small cap value in that. We've got about... A little over 300 in the total world stock index. We've got a little over 75 in the tax managed balance fund. Both of those are at Vanguard. And then in our Roth, we've got a little over 300 in uh, the life strategy moderate growth fund, about 60 in global Wellington, and then about another hundred in various uh, value index, read index funds to to give us a little bit of a value tilt. The house is worth by the time we got out of it and paid and paid the stuff would be worth around two fifty. And then we've got a couple of uh well there were de novo bank stocks when we bought them uh startup banks that when we lived uh when we lived in Alabama we bought we bought a couple of uh a couple of banks that happened to open up where I was working. Wow, that's pretty remarkable. So let's just back up here, Harry. When you started this, what did your allocation look like when you were barely just, let's just say, in your 20s getting into the military? When we start, when I started in the 20s, that would have been in the mid-80s, everything went into an IRA at a bank for the first couple of years because my first my first deployment was, was overseas. And until I came back, the mid '80s was not like it is today. It was not as easy to manage stuff from overseas, so I kept kept stuff in the bank till we came back. And you know, the limits at that point in traditional IRAs was two thousand dollars. And at that point, I was I was single, so I, I was putting two thousand dollars in an IRA, and everything else was sitting in cash until I got back until I got back to the United States. Then when we came back. The first fund we used was a uh, was a balance fund that had about eighty percent in various kinds of stocks. Some of it international. Uh, first first invested with with USAA because the minimums at Vanguard were higher. And then later, as we learned more, we we transitioned everything to Vanguard. Gotcha. So let me just back up here. Harry, on your allocation, so a net worth about 1.8, just over 1.8, right? You mentioned right. you have about 225, 230 in the house, right? So that puts you at about 1.6-ish, let's call it, right? Just just north of 1.6. How much of the 1.6 is retirement versus non-retirement accounts? Probably 74% 
of our net worth is in retirement accounts. About 41% of it is in uh, the Roth accounts. About 33% is in traditional accounts. And the other the other about 26% is in a taxable account. Okay. And then do you hold any cash at all? Just pure cash or something more, I'm not going to say more liquid because stocks are liquid, but cash or bonds? The bonds that we've got are all in are all in the mutual funds in the balanced funds. Uh, we do have we do have some cash in the bank, but except except for next year's Roth IRA contributions, my wife has already spoken for uh, for that as stuff that she wants to spend. She wants to do some home improvements. <laughs> so, speaking of the the IRA and the Roth, you mentioned to us before we started recording that it was about two thousand. Was it twenty two hundred? Was the contribution limit when you first started investing? Right. It was two hundred and fifty for a spouse. Two thousand if you had a non working spouse. It was two hundred and fifty dollars for the non working spouse and two two thousand dollars for for the indiv- individual. So. You know, through the '80s up until up until the mid '90s, that was the max that we were able to put into a retirement. Because I was in, I was in the army, so at that point, the army could not contribute to the thrift savings plan. So that that didn't come about until I'd been in the reserves for for several years, and then the then the contribution limits were very very small for a while. And when you were in the army and, and contributing to these retirement accounts, was that a popular thing to do, or were you? You know, they they tried to sell us on all stuff like that. There were there were people out there. I called into one of these uh, dinners, and so the company paid for dinner. And you know, the company was USPA IRA, and they sold something called the Fidelity Destiny Plan. And they sold a couple of other plans, but these plans had like a fifty percent, a fifty percent load. And I, I know people today who got into that and got and got sucked into that fifty percent first year load. And I, I avoided that and went to USAA for uh, for my investments. But I, don't, I don't think it was all that popular to uh, to invest. I mean, if you look at things. And one thing I've tracked since the mid '90s is the uh, Federal Reserve's Consumer Finance Survey. And you know, if you look at it, half the families that approach retirement have less than two hundred thousand dollars set aside. So I don't think it's I don't think it's ever been a popular thing to start early and try to save money. Yeah, talk to us about that Federal Reserve Consumer Finance Survey because I saw you mention that in your initial email to us, and I'm not super familiar with it, so. What is that, and, and where can people find it, or what did you learn from that? Well, it's it's easy to find. You can Google it. It's on the Federal Reserve's uh, website, and it just breaks down consumer finance. They they survey a, a cross section of consumers and break them down demographically. And as they do that, they talk about okay, they got this much, this many sources of income. This is where their income comes from. This is what they're doing with their income, broken down by homeowners, race, age, whether somebody's been to college or not. And it just gives you a very detailed breakdown of of consumer finances. And I started watching I started watching that. And there's there's two numbers on there. One is the mean number and the other one's the average number. And, you know, the average number is much higher than the mean because it's pulled up by by all the people that you interview on your show. And so at, at that point, I said, OK, I've got I've got more than the mean. If I chase the average, I'll be OK, because we're making basically I was bringing in the med- median family income on my salary for a number of years. So I said, if I, if I can chase the average, if I can just save enough money to uh, to chase the average, then I'll be better off than, you know, 80 percent of the people in the country. And yeah, and that's. Then if then if I'm not okay like that, then nobody's gonna be okay. Right. So when you while you mentioned income, what was your range of income through your working life? Normally we hit that at the end, but I think it fits in here. The army didn't pay particularly well. I mean the fir- the first full year I worked, my taxable income was in the third was in the was in the twenties. And it was in the twenties for several years. Then I got up to 
where I was drawing total, and the Army has, and all the military services, have some stuff that's taxable and non-taxable. And we got up to where we were drawing $4,000 a month, and then the Army got much smaller and took out 38% 38% of the, uh, 38% of the, of the officer corps left because they, they had, they had to get smaller. So they offered people money to go away. They ran some people off. I took money. I took money to go away. I took a long term payout to get out and we took that money. And, you know, at, at that point, we took part of that money and funded. That was about the same time they started the Roth IRAs. So we took that. And started funding the Roth IRAs, and the first year they had those in the mid nineties, it was two thousand dollars a piece. And so we were funding that, and then we took the rest of it, you know, raised two kids and raised two kids, own owned some houses, and tried tried to live a reasonable life. Yeah, so let's jump into that here. You know, we've talked about your allocation here a little bit, and a, and a little bit about your story, but. Tell, tell us your story. I mean, you gave it to us in the email, and I think it's super interesting. It started in the 80s, right? You you joined the Army and, and started in Korea, right? Right. I joined the Army like like a lot of people that joined the Army in, in the 80s. You know, the Army, had, the Army had gotten bigger. It was it was doing good. They came in and laid out, this is what it takes to have, to have a long, successful career and retire sometime in your in your 40s or early 50s with an immediate pension. And so I started out along that track. And after the first Gulf War, they started a they started a drawdown and they took 38 percent of the people out of the organization. So what I, what I learned from that is that no job is stable and that it wasn't that it wasn't that the army lied to people when they told them about the layout in the first place is that. Over time, the truth changed. You know, it's just, it's just hard. They took, as they had to get 38% smaller, just like, just like companies have to lay off people. The army had to, had to get rid of people. So I took the payout, left, went back to school at night, you know, worked, worked jobs where I was while I was going to school, took the long term payout because they offered a, they offered a short term payout that was like six times what the, Six times immediate cash, what the long term was, and I took a payout over 21 years that has to be paid back out of my retirement check. But if I didn't make it to Army Reserve retirement, I wouldn't have to pay it back. And you know, I came off of active duty on the first of the month. My first Army Reserve drill was the. Uh, 10th of the month. And frankly, I credit that second job with the Army Reserve for what, for what allowed us to, uh, to make a lot of money. It will, it will make a difference because I will be able to start drawing an Army Reserve check next year. It'll be about $3,300. And it, but once I've paid back everything the Army paid me, I've got to pay, I got to pay 40% of my check to the Army until they pay that back. And then we'll start to draw $5,500 a month. And that's with a 55% survivor benefit for, uh, for my wife and it's inflation adjusted. So the 5,500 is, is your pension amount. That, that will be the final pension amount once I've paid back the early payout. So you'll have they, about, yeah, 66,000 or so a year. Yes. And then I'll draw, then I plan on working. I plan on working at my federal federal job where I was able to buy back my active duty time when I when I came to work for the uh, when I came to work for the government. So I came to work for the government about ten years ago and bought back about fourteen years of of prior time because I'd been mobilized. I went to Iraq. I was mobilized a couple of times and did various things in the so that will allow me to retire retire at sixty two from the civilian side and draw another about $3,300 a month. And that's again with a 50% survivor, survivor pension. For my so, life. so in total, you'll draw almost 9,000 a month in pensions. Yes. Wow. Not counting social security because I paid into social security <laughs> my entire, 
right. my entire career too. All right, it's going to be more than that. So do you do you count that at all in your net worth, or that that was no. not counted in my net worth? Hard to know, right? I mean, what <laughs> almost a hundred grand a year? More right, it's almost it's almost a hundred grand a year if I live to collect it. Yeah. So back, backing up here, I just want to go back to something you said. You, you said the Army had to get rid of about 38% of its mid-grade officers, right? Yes. How how far along in your career were you at, at that point? How many years and what were you making? I'd been in about 10 years. I was making about $48,000 a year, which was a lot more money in the early 90s than it is now. Sure. And if you didn't take that payout incentive, you could just you could stay in or did they start really pushing people out? I could stay in. I looked at the odds. I listened to what the personnel office was telling me. And I I played the odds. I played the odds as as best I could in that case. And if you if you ran the probabilities and the net net present value, it said it said take the money because the payout was a lot less if they ran if they if they told you you had to leave the payout was a lot less and at, at that point I had a wife and two young kids so it was not it, it was a risk I was not willing to take at that point yeah yeah interesting and, and so I just want to shift gears here Harry as I'm, I'm thinking about your story right you you going through the army the reserves and then this payout happens, right? And you decide to go back to school. And you said you went back to school for at night to get your master's for 15 months, right? right? And now, or just recently, right? Or you're just about to finish your doctor of public administration. Back I've, still, I've still got a dissertation to write, so there is there is no guarantee that that there's no guarantee that that's that that's finished or or close to finished. But I've done all I've done all of the coursework. Yes. How many How back. many years was that? I started in the fall of seventeen. So about so that's been three, three years, years of three years of solid solid coursework. And before that, I went back to school at night and did the Army War College, which is another accredited master's degree. But the Army the Army paid for that, and uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, it's amazing, right? You're going to have over $100,000 in pensions. You had a career with the Army. You went back and got a master's. You went back and got your doctorate. What kept you What kept you going to do all that? What kept driving you? Was it to increase your income? Was it to increase your education levels? Was it to feel like there was a purpose? What, what kept you going this whole time? I mean, you don't hear, <laughs> rarely you hear of somebody who's almost 60 years old, right, and finishing up their doctorate. You know, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess my fa- my father was a workaholic. He was a small town CPA, and he he worked all the time. And you know, I, I spent all that time in in the Army Reserve and doing an Army Reserve school and going and doing stuff on the weekends and using my vacation from work to do Army to do Army Reserve stuff. Even even after I came into the government and they offer some uh they offer some military leave for people who are in the reserves you know i came i came back from my last mobilization and told my wife i'll never use all this leave all this military leave i'll be lucky if i can use all of this before uh before before they force me to retire at the end of at the end of 30 years and you know i was wrong i had used all that in the three and a half years to go and I, I used all of that in the first year, plus my civilian leave, plus I was taking unpaid time off to do to do army stuff. So, you know, when I when I got finished, I started looking for something else to do rather rather than just rather than just sit at the house and uh, and get fat. So here I got to ask, as you're going along this journey, did you ever think about I mean, did you ever make decisions based on getting to those pension values or those pension numbers? You mean you mean putting a number on them or considering just considering I mean you know we talk about careers on our show sometimes and 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 you chosen a, a career in the army and you know a lot of times we hear people hey you know I'm going to do my 20 years or whatever and then I'll go have another career but I want to get that pension value you know because that is such a big part you know when you talk about $100,000 uh you know a year and you know if you 
apply the four percent withdrawal rate to that, which you know comes from the Trinity study. I mean, that's that's worth two and a half million dollars, or maybe even more, depending on how long you live and how long your spouse lives. It was pretty remarkable. You do one point eight plus two point five. I mean, if you, that's really how you look at valuing your net worth, because really, at the end of the day, we're always trying to convert that that income stream or that net worth into an income stream to support your lifestyle right. forever, right? And and you've got a six figure income stream plus you know, 1.8 million. Well, yes, that, that did have, that did have some impact, you know, a couple of times I worked for a while for a small, for a small business. And I made some decisions about going back and mobilizing, going to, uh, going to do some army reserve things, going back, going, going back to Iraq for a tour in combat. And I was able to do that because I knew I had that army reserve, army reserve retirement. And I knew just, just based on what had transpired over, over several years in the small business that the main place that I could look to for final security was not, was not with them. I was not going to, I was not going to get rich with them so I could afford to do army reserve stuff. So I did that. Now I counseled some people later. Who were getting out of the army, and there there are people that were making multiples of what I was making on the civilian on the civilian side, and they said, "Look, I need to get out." And I, I had this long conversation with this very talented junior officer. He said, "I've got I've got to, and here here are the numbers, and I can make two hundred and forty at my civilian job before bonus, and I can't afford to do." I can't afford to do army stuff. I can't afford for them to, to pull me out. And so, yes, that, those things make a difference. You've got to, you've got to make a decision at some point. What, what are you going to prioritize? Because, you know, in the army reserve, just like any other organization, as you, as you climb in the organization, they ask for more and more and more time and more commitment. Yeah, totally. So, Harry, you've got this great net worth built up. Like Clark mentioned, you're, you're finishing another degree here. Where do you go from here? You know, I I think I would like to teach some. Though, though I've got a though I've got a daughter. My my youngest daughter is a is a college professor. When she talks about the politics, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how well I'm going to make it. How well I'm going to make it with that. But. You know, I would like to give back. I, I think at 62, I'm still going to be too young to sit at the house. My wife would love to travel, but she wants to come back home the next day. So <laughs> she, just, she just, you know, we, we went on, we went on a couple of cruises. The seven day cruise was too long. She liked the, she liked the three day cruise. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go somewhere and I'll have a hotel room reserved and have to cancel it because she wants to come home. You know, we, we've been, I saw what I wanted to see. It's time to go home. And I'm like, you realize I drove three hours up here and I'm going to have to drive three hours back tonight to get you home. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. That's funny. Well, while we're on that, are there, are there certain experiences that, that you still want to do or you still want to have at your age with, with the, you know, the money that you've saved up? Or is there something that you're, you know, really longing to do that you haven't done yet? I was trying to talk my wife into taking a uh, round the world cruise, but you know, after this year, I'm not sure I want one of those cruise ships for for months at a time and potentially be. You know, I've been when, when I was in consulting, I've been a, I've been around the country and in Europe. When I was the arm, the army had me in the Middle East and the Far East. You know, I've I've seen I've seen what I need to. I've, I've seen I've seen what I need to see in the world. I mean, there's some there's some beautiful things that that I'd like to see. There are books that I would love to read. I've got a huge library sitting behind me, and in addition to that, a Kindle that's filling up. So I, I don't I don't think I'm going to have a hard time. I don't think I'm going to have a hard time filling filling my life. But you know, I'm I'm one of those. I guess I guess I'm just a, a small town boy, and you know when they. If you turned on the the Andy Griffin show and they talked about going going forty or fifty miles was a was a big trip. I don't I don't I don't need much of anything at this point. Yeah, well, you've done obviously tremendously well, so congrats, and you're gonna you're gonna be Thank in you. a good spot. One thing you mentioned to us before recording, I just wanted to follow up with. You said it's not how much you make, but how you manage what you make. 
What do right. you mean by that? I'm just curious. I, I think you probably have some good advice behind that. Well, you know, it really doesn't matter how much you make. If, if you, you know, Dickens said it 150 years ago, if you're making just a little bit more than what you're spending, you're going to be happy. If you're making a little bit less than what you're spending, you're going to be miserable. One of, one of the books that, that really struck home with me is the Millionaire Next Door series. And, and the whole thing throughout the book was, it's not how much you make, it's whether you hang on to some of what you make, which is the same thing that, you know, they said in, in the richest man in Babylon. It's, you know, a part of all you earn, a part of all you earn is yours to keep. I found an old paperback years ago that some guy who worked at Harris Bank in Chicago had self published when he retired. He talked about managing money and he handed it out to and he handed it out to kids and you know he he talked about coming through the depression and working during world war ii and not a lot of money and just setting aside a little bit of it as you, a little bit of it as you went along and yeah. if you do that if you do that you you will be okay the people the people that listen to this podcast a lot of them are all set are all set on being being millionaires you know, one of one of the things that I participate in is the Boglehead Forum, and you know, somebody looks at somebody looks at something and says, "Look, I'm behind. You got you guys are way ahead." Well, it's not. You don't you don't need to benchmark yourself against all that against all that stuff against people like me who are a little bit crazy. If you go back to that Federal Reserve Consumer Finance Survey. And benchmark yourself against the average, not the median, but the average. You'll be enough, far enough in the top half that that you'll be okay. If you go in and you get a job that's got a that's got a 401k, get the employer match. Save something, you know. Try to try to put something in a Roth IRA. Automate what you're doing. Take it so that it comes either straight out of your check. To, to some place or that it comes out of your bank account. So you don't have to write, you don't have to write another check. You make the decision once and it, it's, it's automated. It is never a good time to invest. I was in high school in the seventies and I can remember after I got my driver's license sitting in, sitting in gas lines because during the seventies, the, the price of gas went from Three dollars a barrel to ten dollars a barrel to thirty dollars a barrel, and it crashed our economy because the prices went up. Then you have the uh, the Volcker years and the Fed, where they took the interest rates up to eighteen percent. And you know, my par- my parents, my my grandparents, my parents never bought stock; they bought bonds, and they made great money in the early eighties buying bonds and they just they just didn't believe in stocks. They were risky after the depression. Then you had the, the tax changes in eighty six that crashed real estate. So then then you had the stock market crash in eighty seven. You've had Enron and WorldCom and the tech bubble and then you had the housing the housing fiasco that crashed the world economy. Then you've got this pandemic it's never a good time to invest, but you've got to set aside money now and start investing. It doesn't matter whether you're whether you're 20 with a little bit or whether you're 50 with a lot. You need you need to figure out how to live below your means and find some money to invest somewhere. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, Harry. Good advice. As you were doing that, as you were investing along the way, as you were finding spaces that you could invest and save on. Did you ever get discouraged or did were you able to keep that long term perspective, right, if you will, and say, hey, one day I'm going to get there? Because now you can look back and say, hey, I'm at, you know, close to two million or over four million if you count your pension, you know, and the, and the potential payout. Did you ever get discouraged along the way? And if so, how did you maintain that focus to keep going and keep saving? Well, look, it's 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 easy to get it's easy to get discouraged because, you know, I, I mentioned that. I've got a value tilt to my portfolio. Well, I had a value tilt in the nineties and I'm at, I'm at church and the guy that runs a, 
the guy, the guy that runs a home improvement business and a guy that ran a grocery store, we're talking about making 50% a year in their stock. And clearly, you weren't doing it right if you weren't making 50%. And, you know, with a buy util, I wasn't making 50%. And the only thing I could say was that, you know, Warren Buffett says he doesn't understand the numbers. So if Warren Buffett doesn't understand the numbers on the investments, then, then I don't understand the numbers. Then in the early 2000s, you know, my wife came in and said, look, I want another house. You know, we were, we were, we were working hard on paying, paying our house off. And this is like 2000, 2004, 2005. And they're talking about, they're talking about liar loans and they're selling $300,000 homes in a county where the median family income is in the forties. And I looked at my wife and said, I don't understand it. I don't understand where the money's coming from. I don't understand how people can afford this. And I don't want to play. I'm taking everything I can get my hands on and I'm throwing it, paying off our house. And I'm just going to sit this out because I don't understand. So yeah, that was, that was discouraging. I didn't, and in neither case was I smart enough to short anything, but I managed to avoid I managed to avoid the two big the two big blow ups. Yeah, I mean pretty interesting looking back on yours, right? You mentioned the two big blow ups and I mean you had the dot com bubble oh eight and now you have this corona. So you have you bought have you did you make any moves in, in those situations at all? Did you buy more stocks? Have you bought more stocks now during COVID? I went both ways. I bought for a little while. And then as it went back up to where it was, I sold. And you can do that. You can do that very easily. I told you I'm in target date funds. I moved out. I moved out on the target date bit. And in the Vanguard life strategy funds, they've got a moderate growth and they've got a growth fund that's at 80%. So I sold some of the moderate growth and bought some growth. And then when it, when it went back up, I sold, I sold out of the growth and went back to the, went back to the moderate growth because I was I was more comfortable where I was, but I did not mind taking a little bit more risk. I mean, I was, I'm going to be around 75% and I, I never got over, I never got over 80% in, uh, in stocks, but I did, I did buy a little bit more. Yeah. My, my wife asked me how much we lost and I said a couple of years salary and uh, <laughs> she was, she was not happy when I said that. <laughs> but back up right right exactly i mean I, i'm up for the not much but i'm a little bit up for the year oh we're at all-time high i mean it, yes, high. it's hard to believe it went up and down so fast but right uh, so so yes i did i did get a little bit more aggressive it's discouraging it's discouraging to have a value tilt over the last five or six years it's discouraging to have about 35% of what I've got in international stocks when, when the U.S. stock market is doing so well. But, right. You know, if you believe in diversification, diversifica- diversification works, whether you want it to or not. Sure, sure. So let me just wrap up here with you, Harry, because we're coming short on time. A couple okay. rapid-fire questions, and then we'll go into some last piece of advice. So what's the most expensive car you've ever purchased? My wife's van, it would have been about 35000 Okay, what about the most expensive meal out that you personally paid for? I paid for two weddings. So, you know, those all in on the weddings, I guess to include the dress, those were probably 10000 a apiece. Uh, besides that, two or 300 Okay. Uh, what's worth the money? What's worth spending more on? Travel experiences. I will tell you, I think probably the best money we ever spent was on an Alaskan cruise. It was it was beautiful. We went in we went in September after the kids were back in school, and it was uh, it it was a beautiful experience. And we had a good time. Nice. What's not worth the money? Stuff. I mean, we we get all we get all tied up. We get all tied up with stuff. And I've got treasures. What what I think what I think of as a treasure, my kids are going to think of as junk. You know, you, you take a look and. Some somebody somebody dies, and you know part of it go part of it goes to the to the trash heap, part of it goes to the estate sale, and most of the time most of the time the the kids would rather have money, and we fill our lives up we fill our lives up with stuff. 
one of the things that I do is uh, is is teach Sunday school, and one of, one of the things that that the Bible teaches us is that we should love people and use things. And too often we get that we get that upside down, and we we love our things and we use the people in our lives. Yeah, yeah, good advice. How old were you when you became a millionaire? About fifty, forty, maybe forty eight. We got this house paid off because we had to move. We moved during the downturn, and we got this house paid off just before I got out of the Army Reserve. And I was I was throwing Army Reserve money in the TSP, and I was throwing Army Reserve money against the mortgage, and got the mortgage paid off for this house in about in about three years. We took everything we got out of the old house and put it into this house, either either into improvements or down payment, plus money from the uh, from the Army Reserve. To, uh, to get it paid off in a hurry. So it would have been 48 or 50. Okay. How much do you spend annually, household spending? About 50. So just in closing here, Harry, any final words of advice? Is there something that you're glad you did? Is there something you wish you would have done better? What, what advice do you give? If you could go back, would you give to the 30-year-old self? We, we, over, we overpaid for, for one of the houses we bought. We bought another house on a VA loan with nothing down. The first, the first car I bought at 25, after I after I came back from overseas, I I fell in love with a car. Now, you know, it it was used, but at that point, I had no business spending spending that much money on a car, having just bought having just bought a house. So, uh, just control control your desire for control your desire for for things because they're not going to uh, they're not going to they're not going to satisfy you. It's, it's the uh, it's the relationships that you have that you have that are important. And you know the the other thing is take the time take the time to invest in your kids. You don't have you don't have forever to forever to invest in your kids. And you know both our kids at this point. Are married with kids. We got some great grandkids, and uh, both of them have graduate degrees. So we are very, we are, we are very blessed. It's been a, it's been a blessing to be in this country. It's been it was a blessing to be associated with the uh, with the United States Army. My wife has been my wife has been a blessing. This is a great country, regardless of the turbulence that's going on right now, and. As Warren Buffett says, don't don't bet against this country. Yeah, yeah. Well, re- really good stuff, and and thanks for coming on, Harry. Really appreciate it. Amazing story that you've had. Thanks for your service in the army. Been in the army over what about a thirty year career now. So net worth of close to two million. Really more than that if you count your your pensions coming in close to nine thousand dollars a month. So masters, doctor of public administration. So really an amazing life, amazing career, and and very successful. So thanks again for coming on, sharing your story. We're, we're really appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.